This past year, I was taking an AP drawing course for my junior year of high school, and in this class particularly, I ran into a few problems, had some questions and concerns that I'm sure many other students in any other school have had. And no, it wasn't that I was terrible or lacking skill at drawing. Maybe. But the main sort of dilemma or issue I had with the class was the grading. The question I had was this. How do you grade art? I'm sure I'm not the first to ask this question, and I think it's one worth asking, considering that most, if not all, public or private schools around the world have either a mandatory or optional art class that is graded. For parents, if there are any listening, when your child comes home with their report card and you see that they have a 95 for their art class, have you ever wondered what gives my child a 95 opposed to another student who got a 97 or a 91? Unless you're turning in assignments late or you're plainly not trying, is there really a reason for you to not receive a 100 for the class? Because the truth is, art is subjective. And like most subjective things, you can't put a grade on it. You can't say how good or bad it is with a number or a label. Good or bad art is relative and depends on an individual's distinct perception and opinion, and that is the obvious. So considering the obvious, how do teachers get around the subjectivity of art when grading a student's work? How does a teacher determine one student's performance as a 95 opposed to a 91? To combat this problem, one of the solutions that educators came up with, which I'm positive all you guys are familiar, was the creation of the rubric. This table with criteria and specific guidelines eliminated teacher bias and student complaints. Rubrics today receive worldwide praise by teachers for its ease of use and ability to justify the grade. Now, if a student thinks he or she doesn't deserve a certain mark, they need only to see the rubric and where their points got taken off. A rubric also gives specific guidelines so that students have a clear idea of what the expectations are beforehand, allowing them to create a more satisfactory essay or artwork. Essentially, students are held accountable. However, in the case of art, the story is a little different. Here's an example of an art rubric. All these categories in themselves have an inherent issue. These broad general criteria are vague, and with it using a skill strikingly homogenous to star ratings for online products, there is still room and space for subjectivity. What constitutes for a good composition, for example? If the unit was on composition and a student decided to purposely create awkward composition to incite uneasiness in the viewer, Perhaps they better convey whatever message he or she was trying to portray. Does he or she get points off even though understanding is clear? This falls into the mastery versus traditional grading debate, which takes a more significant look into the progress rather than the final results. And rubrics play a really big part in this because rubrics measure the final result, not the progress. And that's something that teachers must consider. And especially with art being so subjective, with good or bad being relative to an individual's perceptions, the thoughts and progress of the student are the most important for them the final work. But even so, their intentions and motivation cannot be properly graded since that's also subjective and creativity could also be dependent on the person's natural ability to formulate completely new and evocative idea. I know this may sound confusing and there's a really good reason for it. If everything is so subjective, it's not a question of how we grade art, it's why we grade art. And here's a solution. And rubrics don't help, but discussions do. In an interview with Elan Gutin from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, I asked how they score their students, and his answer was simple. They don't. There is no final number grade. Rubrics inhibit creativity, and their subjectivity and their subjective guidelines hinder a student's ability to access their maximum capacity. Hence, the ineffectiveness of rubrics and the effectiveness of displaying your artwork for the rest of the studio to see. Each student is going to be different, experiment, and try new things. And if they fail at it, they shouldn't be punished. You might be thinking, well, college expectations are different from high school expectations. But if an art class's purpose is to only teach skills, not help build a creative sense of mind, then rubrics on the class itself will be promoting mechanical instruction that bypasses the human act of composing. However, it's not just art. For most, rubrics are most relatable in writing classes. In fact, rubrics can be very effective in writing classes to eliminate subjective grading and can be a very fair and just way to score someone's paper or essay. But not most rubrics. If you haven't been a teacher or used a rubric before to grade, making a rubric is really hard, specifically for the reason of trying to eliminate subjectivity. So most writing rubrics still carry the flaw that causes unfair grading. An exceeds or the top score for a category in a writing rubric usually determines a paper as excellent if the student 
expertly or perceptively utilizes such skill effectively. One teacher might think one paper is perceptive and give it a high mark, but another teacher might think otherwise and give it a low mark, sometimes even within the same school. And if you are a victim of this unfair and ineffective rubric, what the school tells you is this. This is life. And as a disclaimer, it may seem like I'm a student complaining about his grades at this point and how he thinks his school system is unfair, but that's not true because rubrics, while they are relatively new, are being used in most upper level education all across the world. And because they are new, there aren't too many that are effective or doing it right. No matter what scale of grading a teacher uses, the one characteristic they all have in common is that they are reductionist in nature. An essay or any product of a student's opinions or imaginative mind is unique and such grading attempts to reduce it to two digits or a single number or letter. Grading is degrading and rubrics are no exception. An elementary school teacher, Donna Patrick, noticed that students who had, quote, stylistic voices full of humor and surprises produced less interesting essays when they followed an outline rubric. This goes for the same with art. Schools say they aim to teach students with deep learning, but as author Holden Sullivan states, rubrics reduce deep learning to check sheets. So schools are wrong. Unfair subjective grading is not life, especially when it's the result of contradictory methods and is an important factor to someone's future. Students who learn to use rubrics for most of their classes and practice following guidelines and rules for conformity find that it's not beneficial for life. For most of our lives, there will not be a rubric that tells us how to be better and stronger independent thinkers. As Rorty Fullender III puts it, the reason why students attend our best schools, the reason why students attend our best schools is to explore the potential of knowledge, not to conform to constraints of educational institutions. Rubrics are most realistic to experiential reality when they are less visible, less oppressive, and open to interpretation and imagination. While rubrics are helpful to teachers and hold students accountable, there is no denying that rubrics inhibit a student's full potential and contradicts the purpose of an education. This argument easily pertains to more than just rubrics, and what it can tell you is that while they provide ease for teachers, it's not effective in our learning. For art, getting rid of rubrics entirely may be the most effective way in building creative and independent artists. Discussions and critiques should replace numbers and letters. For writing, improving rubrics to allow for more room for students to express their ideas and potential may be the best possible solution. To fix the problem of broad and general subjective criteria, having a clear distinction of what's good, exemplar, and what's not could patch some of the holes in room for subjectivity. In the end, I'm just a student. I can't tell you exactly what steps need to occur in order for a better learning and grading experience. But from my experience, I know that as students, we need to be asking more questions like, how or why do we grade art? How or why do we grade writing? And are rubrics really successful at delivering their purpose? Questions are the base of learning and the beginning of solutions. And as students, that's the most we can do. And what I ask for our students, parents, and educators to do for the better sake and benefit of our schools and futures. So as a final question, if rubrics are bad, what can we do to improve them and how can it affect a greater society? Thank you.